Book Two, Chapter Five of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Two, Pendle Forest. Chapter Five. Bess's of the Booth. Bess's of the Booth, for so the little hostel at Goldshaw was called, after its mistress, Bess Whitaker, was far more comfortable and commodious than its unpretending exterior seemed to warrant. Stouter and brighter ale was not to be drunk in Lancashire than Bess brewed, nor was better sherry's or clary to be found, go where you would, than in her cellars. The traveller crossing these dreary wastes, and riding from Burnley to Clitheroe, or from Colne to Whaley, as the case might be, might well halt at Bess's and be sure of a roast fowl for dinner, with the addition, perhaps, of some trout from Pendlewater, or, if the season permitted, a heathcock or a pheasant. Or, if he tarried there for the night, he was equally sure of a good supper and fair linen. It has already been mentioned that at this period it was the custom of all classes in the northern counties, men and women, to resort to the alehouses to drink, and the hostel at Goldshaw was the general rendezvous of the neighbourhood. For those who could afford it, Bess would brew incomparable sack, but if a guest called for wine, and she liked not his looks, she would flatly tell him her ale was good enough for him, and if it pleased him not he should have nothing. Submission always followed in such cases, for there was no disputing with Bess. Neither would she permit the frequenters of the hostel to sit later than she chose, and would clear the house in a way equally characteristic and effectual. At a certain hour, and that by no means a late one, she would take down a large horsewhip, which hung on a convenient peg in the principal room, and after bluntly ordering her guests to go home, if any resistance were offered, she would lay the whip across their shoulders, and forcibly eject them from the premises. But as her determined character was well known, this violence was seldom necessary. In strength, Bess was a match for any man, and assistance from her cowherds, for she was a farmer as well as hostess, was at hand if required. As will be surmised from the above, Bess was large and masculine-looking, but well-proportioned nevertheless, and possessed of a certain coarse kind of beauty, which in earlier years had inflamed Richard Baldwin, the miller of Rough Lee, who made overtures of marriage to her. These were favourably entertained, but a slight quarrel occurring between them, the lover, in her own phrase, got his jacket soundly dusted by her, and declared off, taking to wife a more docile and light-handed maiden. As to Bess, though she had given this unmistakable proof of her ability to manage a husband, she did not receive a second offer, nor, as she had now attained the mature age of forty, did it seem likely that she would ever receive one. Bess's at the Booth was an extremely clean and comfortable house. The floor, it is true, was of hard clay, and the windows little more than narrow slits, with heavy stone frames, further darkened by minute diamond panes. But the benches were scrupulously clean, and so was the long oak table in the centre of the principal and only large room in the house. A roundabout fireplace occupied one end of the chamber, sheltered from the draught of the door by a dark oak screen, with a bench on the warm side of it and here, or in the deep ingle-nooks on winter nights, the neighbours would sit and chat by the blazing hearth, discussing pots of nappy ale, good and stale, as the old ballad hath it, and as persons of both sexes came thither, young as well as old, many a match was struck up by Bess's cheery fireside. From the blackened rafters hung a goodly supply of hams, sides of bacon and dried tongues, with a profusion of oat-cakes in a bread-flake while, in case this store should be exhausted, means of replenishment were at hand in the huge, full-crammed meal-chest standing in one corner. Altogether, there was a look of abundance as well as of comfort about the place. Great was Bess's consternation when the poor peddler, who had quitted her house little more than an hour ago, full of health and spirits, was brought back to it in such a deplorable condition, and when she saw him deposited at the door— Notwithstanding her masculine character, she had some difficulty in repressing a scream. She did not, however, yield to the weakness, but seeing at once what was best to be done, 
caused him to be transported by the grooms to the chamber he had occupied overnight, and laid upon the bed. Medical assistance was fortunately at hand, for it chanced that Master Sudel, the surgeon of Colne, was in the house at the time, having been brought to Goldshaw by the great sickness that prevailed at Sabston and elsewhere in the neighbourhood. Sudol was immediately in attendance upon the sufferer, and bled him copiously, after which the poor man seemed much easier, and Richard Asherton, taking the surgeon aside, asked his opinion of the case, and was told by Sudol that he did not think the peddler's life in danger, but he doubted whether he would ever recover the use of his limbs. "'You do not attribute the attack to witchcraft, I suppose, Master Sudol? said Richard. "'I did not like to deliver an opinion, sir.' replied the surgeon. It is impossible to decide when all the appearances are precisely like those of an ordinary attack of paralysis, but a sad case has recently come under my observation, as to which I can have no doubt. I mean, as it to its being the result of witchcraft. But I will tell you more about it presently, for I must now return to my patient. It being agreed among the party to rest for an hour at the little hostel, and partake of some refreshment, Nicholas went to look after the horses, while Roger Nowell and Richard remained in the room with the peddler. Bess Whitaker owned an extensive farmyard, provided with cow-houses, stables, and a large barn, and it was to the latter place that the two grooms proposed to repair with Sparshot, and play a game of luggets on the clay floor. No one knew what had become of the reeve, for on depositing the poor peddler at the door of the hostel he had mounted his horse and ridden away. Having ordered some fried eggs and bacon, Nicholas wended his way to the stable, while Bess, assisted by a stout kitchen wench, busied herself in preparing the eatables, and it was at this juncture that Master Potts entered the house. Bess eyed him narrowly, and was by no means prepossessed by his looks, while the muddy condition of his habiliments did not tend to exalt him in her opinion. "'You may you sell her home, mon, I mun say,' she observed, as the attorney seated himself on the bench beside her. "'To be sure,' rejoined Potts, "'where should a man make himself at home, if not at an inn? These eggs and bacon look very tempting. I'll try some presently, and as soon as you've done with the frying-pan I'll have a bottle of sack.' "'Nay, you winner,' replied Bess. "'You'll get neither eggs nor bacon the sack here, I can promise you. "'Ale and wet cakes won't save your turn. "'Go to town with other grooms, and play at kittlepins and iron-holes with em, "'and I'll send you some ale.' "'I'm quite comfortable where I am, thank you, hostess,' replied Potts, "'and I have no desire to play at kittlepins or nine-holes. "'But what does this bottle contain? "'Share it.' replied Bess. "'Sherries,' echoed Potts. "'And yet you say I can have no sack. Get me some sugar and eggs, and I'll show you how to brew the drink. I was taught the art by my friend Ben Johnson. Rare Ben! <laughs> Set the bottle down!' cried Bess angrily. "'What do you mean, woman?' said Potts, staring at her in surprise. "'I told you to fetch sugar and eggs, and I now repeat the order. Sugar and half a dozen eggs at least.' "'And I repeat my order to you,' cried Bess, "'to set the bottle down, or I'll make you.' "'Make me? Oh, I like that,' cried Potts. "'Let me tell you, woman, I am not accustomed to being ordered in this way. "'I shall do no such thing. "'If you will not bring the eggs, I shall drink the wine neat and unsophisticate.' "'And he filled a flagon near him. "'If you are done, you shall pay dearly for it.' said Bess, putting aside the frying-pan and taking down the horsewhip. "'I dare say I shall,' replied Potts merrily. "'You hostesses generally do make one pay dearly. <laughs> Very good sherry, this, faith, the true nutty flavour. Now do go and fetch me some eggs, my good woman. You must have plenty with all the poultry I saw in the farmyard, and then I'll teach you the whole art and mystery of brewing sack.' "'I'll teach you to dispute my orders,' cried Bess and catching the attorney by the collar, she began to belabour him soundly with the whip. "'Hello! Oh, oh, what's the meaning of this?' cried Potts, struggling to get free. "'Assault and battery! Oh. "'Ah, assault and battery, yo, and baste your toe!' replied Bess, continuing to lay on the whip. "'Why, zounds, this pass is a joke!' cried the attorney. "'How desperately strong she is! I shall be murdered! Help, help! That woman must be a witch!' "'A witch! I'll teach you to call me foul names!' 
cried the enraged hostess, laying on with greater fury. "'Help! help!' roared Potts. At this moment Nicholas returned from the stables, and, seeing how matters stood, flew to the attorney's assistance. "'Come, come, Bess!' he cried, laying hold of her arm. "'You've given him enough. What has Master Potts been about? Not insulting you, I hope.' "'Nay, I take care he dinner do that, squire,' replied the hostess. "'I told him he'd get no but ale here, and he made free with my bottle. So I brought down whip just to teach him manners.' "'You teach me, you ignorant and insolent hussy!' cried Potts furiously. "'Do you think I am to be taught manners by an overgrown Lancashire witch like you? "'I'll teach you what it is to assault a gentleman. "'I prefer an instant complaint against you to my single good friend and client, "'Master Roger, who is in your house, and you'll soon find out whom you've got to deal with.' "'Marry, come out!' exclaimed Bess. "'Who can it be? I took you for one at Groom's man. "'Fire and fury!' exclaimed Potts. "'This is intolerable. Master Noel shall let you know who I am, woman.' "'Say, <laughs> I'll tell you, Bess,' interposed Nicholas, laughing. "'This little gentleman is a London lawyer who is going to rough lay on business with Master Roger Noel. Unluckily, he got pitched into a quagmire in Reed Park, and that's the reason why his countenance and abilements have got me grand.' Eh, hey, I thought he were a strange fettle.' replied Bess. "'And so is a lawyer from London, eh? Well,' she added, laughing and displaying two ranges of very white teeth, "'he'll remember Bess Whitaker next time he comes to Pendle Forest. And she'll remember me,' said Potts. "'Nay, no more sauce, man,' cried Bess, "'or I'll rattle their bones again.' "'No, you won't, woman.' cried Potts, snatching up his horse-whip, which he had dropped in the previous scuffle, and brandishing it fiercely. "'I dare you to touch me!' Nicholas was obliged once more to interfere, and as he passed his arms round the hostess's waist, he thought a kiss might tend to bring matters to a peaceable issue, so he took one. <laughs> "'Done me, yet, squire!' cried Bess, who, however, did not look very seriously offended by the liberty." "'By my faith, your lips are so sweet that I must have another,' cried Nicholas. "'I tell you what, Bess, you're the finest woman in Lancashire, and you owe it to the county to get married.' "'Why so?' said Bess. "'Because it would be a pity to lose the breed,' replied Nicholas. "'What say you to Master Potts there? Will he suit you?' "'He? Pooh! Do you think I'd put up with such power from him as he? No.' "'When Bess Whitaker, the landlady of Goldshaw's wed, it shall be a mon, and nay to a ninny her. "'Bravely resolved, Bess,' cried Nicholas. "'You deserve another kiss for your spirit.' "'And done with you, I say,' cried Bess, dealing him a gentle tap that sounded very much like a buffet. "'See our young jobber now is grinning at you.' "'Jobber now a ninny hammer cried Potts furiously. "'Really, woman, I cannot permit such names to be applied to me.' "'As you please, but I'll give you nay better,' rejoined the hostess. "'Come, Bess, a truce to this,' observed Nicholas. "'The eggs and bacon are spoiling, and I'm dying me hunger. "'There, there,' he added, clapping her on the shoulder. "'Set the dish before us, there's a good soul. "'Couple of plates, some oat cakes and butter, and we shall do.' "'And while Bess attended to these requirements, he observed, "'This sudden seizure of poor John Law's a bad business.' "'Deed it is, squire,' replied Bess. "'I was quite glopping the seat on him. "'Lord, you say me, why, it's scarcely an hour since he left there, "'looking as strong and as hearty as yourself. "'But it's a hazardly uncertain life we lead. "'Ere to-day and gone to-morrow, as Parson Hodson says. "'Well, a day!' "'True, true, Bess,' replied the squire. "'and the best plan, therefore, is to make the most of the passing moment. "'So brew us each a lusty pottle of sack, and fry us some more eggs and bacon.' "'And while the hostess proceeded to prepare the sack, Potts remarked to Nicholas, "'I have got another case of witchcraft, squire, "'Mary Baldwin, the miller's daughter of Ralph Lee.' "'Indeed!' exclaimed Nicholas. "'What, is the poor girl bewitched?' "'Bewitched to death, that's all,' said Potts. "'Eh, hey, poor Mary!' "'Who's to be buried here this morning?' observed Bess, emptying the bottle of sherry into a pot and placing the latter on the fire. "'And do you think she was forspoken?' said Nicholas, addressing her. "'Folk saying so,' 
replied Bess, but I'd now the hang my tongue about it. Then I suppose you pay tribute to Mother Chatterton's hostess, cried Potts. Butter, eggs, and milk from the farm, ale and wild from the cellar, with a flitch of bacon now and then, eh? Nay, by the muskets, I'll gi' you a note, cried Bess. Then you bribe Mother Demdike, and that comes to the same thing, said Potts. Weren't you no so far from Nark this time? replied Bess, adding eggs, sugar, and spice to the now boiling wine, and staring up the compound. "'I wonder where your brother, the reeve of the forest, can be, Master Potts,' observed Nicholas. "'I did not see either him or his horse at the stables.' "'Perhaps the arch-impostor has taken himself off altogether,' said Potts. "'And if so, I shall be sorry, for I have not done with him.' The sack was now set before them, and pronounced excellent and while they were engaged in discussing it, together with a fresh supply of eggs and bacon, fried by the kitchen wench, Roger Nowell came out from the inner room, accompanied by Richard and the surgeon. "'Well, Master Thoodle, how goes on your patient?' inquired Nicholas of the latter. "'Much more favourably than I expected, Squire,' replied the surgeon. "'He will be better left alone for a while, and I shall not quit the village till evening. I shall be able to look well after him.' "'You think the attack occasioned by witchcraft, of course, sir?' said Potts. Uh, "'The poor fellow affirms it to be so, but I can give no opinion,' replied Suddle evasively. "'You must make up your mind as to the matter, for I think it right to tell you your evidence will be required,' said Potts. "'Perhaps you may have seen poor Mary Baldwin, the miller's daughter of Rough Lee, and can speak more positively as to her case.' "'How oh, can, sir?' replied the surgeon seating himself beside Potts, while Roger Nowell and Richard placed themselves on the opposite side of the table. "'This is the case I referred to a short time ago, when answering your inquiries on the same subject, Master Richard, and the most afflicting one it is. But you shall have the particulars. Six months ago, Mary Baldwin were as lovely and blooming a lass as could be seen, the joy of her widowed father's heart.' The hot-headed obstinate man is Richard Baldwin, and he was unwise enough to incur the displeasure of Mother Demdark by favouring her rival, old Chattox, to whom he gave flour and meal, while he refused the same tribute to the other. The first time Mother Demdark was dismissed without the customary door, one of his millstones broke, and instead of taking this as a warning, he became more obstinate. She came a second time, and he sent her away with curses. Then all his flour grew damp and musty, and no one would buy it. Still he remained obstinate, and when she appeared again he would have laid hands upon her, but she raised her staff and the blows fell short. "'I've given thee two warnings, Richard,' she said, and thou hast paid no heed to them. Now I will make thee smart lad in right earnest. That which thou lovest best thou shalt lose. Upon this, Bethinking him that the dearest thing he had in the world was his daughter Mary, and afraid of harm happening to her, Richard would fain have made up his quarrel with the old witch, but it had now gone too far, and she would not listen to him. But uttering some word by which the name and the girl was mingled, shook her staff at the arse and departed. Next day poor Mary was taken ill, and her father in despair replied to old Chattox, who promised him help, and, and did her best to make no doubt, for she would have willingly thwarted her rival, and robbed her of her prey. But the latter was too strong for her, and that plus victim got daily worse and worse. Her blooming cheek grew white and hollow, her dark eyes glistened with unnatural lustre, and she was seen no more on the banks of Pendle Water. Before this my head had been called in by the afflicted father. I did all I could, but I knew she'd die, and I told him so. The information I feared had killed him, for he fell down like a stone, and I repented having spoken. However, he recovered and made a last appeal to Mother Demdark, but unrelenting I derided him and cursed him, telling him if he brought her all his milk contained and added to that all his substance, she would not spare the child. They returned heartbroken, and never quitted the poor girl's bedside till she breathed her last. Poor Rochus, Robert of his only daughter, and, and no wife to cheer him. Ah! 
pity him from the bottom of my heart,' said Bess, whose tears had flowed freely during the narration. "'He is well now crazed with grief,' said the surgeon. "'I hope he will commit no rash act.' Expressions of deep commiseration for the untimely death of the miller's daughter had been uttered by all the party, and they were talking over the strange circumstances attending it, when they were roused by the trampling of horses' feet at the door, and the moment after a middle-aged man, clad in deep mourning, but put on in a manner that betrayed the disorder of his mind, entered the house. His looks were wild and frenzied, his cheeks haggard, and he rushed into the room so abruptly that he did not at first observe the company assembled. "'Well, wow, Richard Bolden, is that you?' cried the surgeon. "'What, is this the father?' exclaimed Potts, taking out his memorandum-book. "'I must prepare to interrogate him.' "'Sit thee down, Richard, sit thee down, mon,' said Bess, taking his hand kindly and leading him to a bench. "'Can I get thee anything?' "'No, no, Bess.' replied the miller. I have quite lost all I valued in this world, and I care not how soon I quit it myself. Nay, don't twerk on thus, Richard, said Bess, in accents of sincere sympathy. Then we live to see happier and brighter days. I will live to be revenged, Bess, cried the miller, rising suddenly and stamping his foot on the ground. That accursed witch has robbed me of my heart's chief treasure who's crushed a poor innocent has never injured her he thought or deed and has struck the heaviest blow that could be dealt me but by the heaven above i win requiter i feel this deep and lasting curse laid on her guilty head and on those all her accursed race no rest night or day will i know till i have brought em to the stake right right my good friend an excellent resolution bring em to the stake cried Potts. But his enthusiasm was suddenly checked by observing the reeve of the forest peeping from behind the wainscot, and earnestly regarding the miller as he called the attention of the latter to him. Richard Baldwin mechanically followed the expressive gestures of the attorney, but he saw no one, for the reeve had disappeared. The incident passed unnoticed by the others, who had been too deeply moved by poor Baldwin's outbursts of grief to pay any attention to it. After a little while, Bess Whitaker succeeded in prevailing upon the miller to sit down, and when he became more composed, he told her that the funeral procession, consisting of some of his neighbours, who had undertaken to attend his ill-fated daughter to her last home, was coming from Rough Lee to Goldshaw, but that, unable to bear them company, he had ridden on by himself. It appeared also from his muttered threats that he had meditated some wild project of vengeance against Mother Demdike, which he intended to put into execution before the day was over. But Master Potts endeavoured to dissuade him from this course, assuring him that the most certain and efficacious mode of revenge he could adopt would be through the medium of the law, and that he would give him his best advice and assistance in the matter. While they were talking thus the bell began to toll, and every stroke seemed to vibrate through the heart of the afflicted father, who was at last so overpowered by grief that the hostess deemed it expedient to lead him into an inner room, where he might indulge his sorrow unobserved. Without awaiting the issue of this painful scene, Richard, who was much affected by it, went forth, and taking his horse from the stable, with the intention of riding on slowly before the others, led the animal towards the churchyard. When within a short distance of the grey old fabric he paused, the bell continued to toll mournfully, and deepened the melancholy hue of his thoughts. The sad tale he had heard held possession of his mind, and while he pitied poor Mary Baldwin, he began to entertain apprehensions that Alison might meet a similar fate. So many strange circumstances had taken place during the morning's ride, he had listened to so many dismal relations, that coupled with the dark and mysterious events of the previous night, he was quite bewildered, and felt oppressed, as if by a hideous nightmare which it was impossible to shake off. He thought of mothers Demdike and Chattox. Could these dread beings be permitted to exercise such baneful influence over mankind? With all the apparent proofs of their power he had received— he still strove to doubt, and to persuade himself that the various cases of witchcraft described to him were only held to be such by the timid and the credulous. Full of these meditations, he tied his horse to a tree, and entered the churchyard, 
and while pursuing a path shaded by a row of young lime-trees leading to the porch, he perceived at a little distance from him, near the cross erected by Abbot Cliderhoe, two persons who attracted his attention. One was the sexton, who was now deep in the grave, and the other an old woman with her back towards him. Neither had remarked his approach, and influenced by an unaccountable feeling of curiosity, he stood still to watch their proceedings. Presently the sexton, who was shovelling out the mould, paused in his task, and the old woman, in a hoarse voice which seemed familiar to the listener, said, "'What hast found, Zachariah?' "'That which your lack, mother,' replied the sexton. "'A mazard with all the teeth in it.' "'Block out eight, and give them to me,' replied the hag. And as the sexton complied with her injunction, she added, "'Nah, I must have three scalps.' "'Here they be, mother,' replied Zachariah, uncovering a heap of mould with his spade. Two brain pans bleached like snow, and the third be more air on it than I have of my own sconce. For its size and shape I should take it to be a female. But I laid these three skulls aside for you. What do you mean to do with them? "'Question me not, Zachariah,' said the hag sternly. "'Now nah, give me some pieces of the mouldering coffin.' "'Fill this box with the dust of the corpse it contained.' "'The sexton complied with her request. "'Now you have gotten all you seek, mother,' he said. "'I would pray you to take your departure, "'for the burying folks when be here presently.' "'I'm going,' replied the hag. "'But first I must have my funeral rites performed. <laughs> "'Bury this for me, Zachariah,' she said, "'giving him a small clay figure.' Bury it deep, and see it moulders away. And as it moulders away, may she it represents pine and weather till she come to the grave likewise. And whom doth it represent, mother? asked the sexton, regarding the image with curiosity. I dunna know the face. How should you know it, fool, since you never seen her in whose likeness is it is made? replied the hag. "'She is connected with the race I hate.' "'With the dem dykes?' inquired the sexton. "Ah," replied the hag, "'with the dem dykes. "'She passes for one of them, but she's not one of them. "'Nevertheless, I hate her as though she were.' "'You don't mean Alison Device,' said the sexton. "'I heard her be very comely and kind-hearted, "'and I should be sorry any harm befell her.' Mary Baldwin, who soon lie there, was quite as comely and kind-hearted as Alison, cried the hag, and yet Mother Demdike had no pity on her. Ah, that's true, replied the sexton. Well, well, I'll do your bidding. Hold, exclaimed Richard, stepping forward. I will not suffer this abomination to be practised. Who oh, is it speaks to me? cried the hag, turning round and disclosing the hideous countenance of Mother Chattox. "'The vice is that of Richard Asherton.' "'It is Richard Asherton who speaks,' cried the young man, "'and I command you to desist from this wickedness. "'Give me that clay image,' he cried, snatching it from the sexton, "'and trampling it to dust beneath his feet. "'Thus I destroy thy impious handiwork, and defeat thy evil intentions.' "'Ah, thinkst thou so, lad?' rejoined Mother Chattox. Thou wilt find thyself mistaken. My curse has already alighted on thee, and it shall work. Thou lovest Alison, I know it, but she shall never be thine. Now go thy ways. I will go, replied Richard, but you shall come with me, woman. Dare you lay hands on me? screamed the hag. Nay, let her be, master, interposed the sexton. You are better. "'You are as bad as she is,' said Richard, "'and deserve equal punishment. "'You escaped yesterday at Whaley, old woman, "'but you shall not escape me now.' "'Be not too sure of that,' cried the hag, "'disabling him for the moment "'by a severe blow on the arm from her staff, "'and shuffling off with an agility "'which could scarcely have been expected from her, "'she passed through a gate near her "'and disappeared behind a high wall. "'Richard would have followed,' but he was detained by the sexton, who besought him as he valued his life not to interfere. And when at last he broke away from the old man, he could see nothing of her, and only heard the sound of horses' feet in the distance. 
Either his eyes deceived him, or at a turn in the woody lane skirting the church, he descried the reeve of the forest galloping off with the old woman behind him. This lane led towards Rough Lee, and without a moment's hesitation Richard flew to the spot where he had left his horse, and mounting him rode swiftly along it. End of chapter 5